Welcome to Epworth. We're glad that you're here to worship with us this Christmas Eve night. On behalf of all of the members of Epworth, we're glad that you're here. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Pastor Trish, and I serve here as lead pastor alongside Bill Jones, our pastor for youth and young adults. Will you stand and join us in the call to worship? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form. A void and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Let us pray. God, we thank you that you have called us this night into your sanctuary, that we might all stand together and welcome Christmas Day, the day that we celebrate Christ's birth. We pray that you would help him be born in each of our hearts this night, that our worship might be full of truth and grace. Amen. As Ruby and Charlene come up to light the Advent candle, I just want to let you know our tradition over the last few weeks. Here at Epworth, we've been celebrating the diversity of languages amongst us, and so each week as we light the Advent candle, we hear a piece of it in a different language. So far, we've heard French and Bosnian, one of the dialects from India, and a dialect from Kenya. And tonight, Ruby is going to do um, the Advent candle liturgy in sign language for us. So it will be silent except for her signing, but the English words will be on the screen for you to read, and then we'll all join together in the prayer at the end. So Ruby and Charlene. together. We rejoice in God's steadfast presence in our lives and in God's unique presence in the life of Jesus of Nazareth, born of Mary, growing through childhood into an adult ministry in all his life, manifesting the peace, love, and justice of God. His voice undimmed by the centuries, his call and his promise as clear to us as it was to his disciples so long ago. Come to us, Lord Jesus. Be born in us this night, in our hearts, our minds, our lives. May the light of your life be kindled in us and lead us to the shining truth of God with us, God for us, God in us. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson for this evening is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. 
But people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders. And he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually. And there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onwards and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
going to steal this. Play musical stands. Will you stand for the reading of the gospel lesson? Our lesson tonight comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. I invite you to listen for a word from the Lord. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this night. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I realize tonight that um, this is the 10th year that I have had the um, awesome honor and privilege of standing in a pulpit on a Christmas Eve service to deliver the Christmas message. And after 10 years, it still terrifies me. It is the only night, the only service of the year that I get nervous and anxious. And so uh, what you do when you're nervous and anxious is to share that nervousness and anxious with other people. And I belong to a group called the Young Clergy Women Project, which is an online community for young clergy women. And uh, one of the people posted this week, you know you're a pastor on Christmas Eve when, and then let everybody else respond. In an hour, there were 68 responses. I just wanted to share with you too. You know you're a pastor on Christmas Eve when you had cookies for breakfast and lunch and dinner, and you're totally fine with that. <laughs> you know you're a pastor on Christmas Eve when you're on your sixth cup of coffee for the day and you're still sleepy. Both of those have been true for me. So I want to share with you one story of a Christmas Eve gone awry that resulted in something beautiful and timeless. It's the story of how the song Silent Night was written, and I left it over there, so I'm going to go get it. You know, the good thing is I'm getting lots of steps in tonight, <laughs> so I may yet beat Pastor Bill. He beats me every day. I might really already? Shoot. So the story of Silent Night. In 1817, 25-year-old Joseph Moore was assigned to the position of assistant priest at St. Nicholas Church in Austria. He was a lover of music and so was placed in charge of music at this small church, and he often wrote poems and song lyrics for special services. In 1818, during a particularly cold winter, 
He was making last minute preparations for a special Christmas Eve mass, a service that he had been planning and preparing for for months. Everything from music to the message was in place, but as he got to the church and cleaned and readied the sanctuary, he encountered an unfathomable dilemma on a Christmas Eve. St. Nicholas's organ wouldn't play. It was broken. Nothing he could do worked. He worked for hours on the old instrument, making adjustments, fiddling with the keys and stops and pedals, even at one point crawling behind the console to see if he could find a problem. But in spite of his efforts, the organ remained silent, its voice as still as a dark winter's night. So realizing he could do nothing else, the priest paused and prayed for inspiration. He asked God to show him a way to bring music to his congregation on the year's most meaningful day of worship. And the answer to that prayer became Silent Night. He had written the poem two years before in 1816, and it came to memory as he prayed to God that night, so he brought out the verses and worked them over a little extra. And then he took them to a 31-year-old school teacher named Franz Gruber. Franz was struggling to stay warm in his drafty apartment over the schoolhouse. He had once studied organ, but he now played the instrument only at St. Nicholas's modest service, not at any of the really good ones like Christmas Eve. As he went over notes from one of his lessons, he was surprised to hear an insistent knock at his door and to find Father Moore on the other side. After a quick Merry Christmas, the priest began to tell Franz the issue and finally got him to understand that nothing was going to fix the organ. So he showed him the poem that he had written and begged him to write music that would be easily learned by the choir and something the congregation could join in on that would be played on a guitar. In 1817, in a church, a guitar. Who knew? After studying the poem, Gruber nodded his head and uh, a tune began to come and he wrote it. So hours later, in a candlelit sanctuary much like ours tonight, they shared this new music with the congregation and it quickly became a favorite. It would be passed on from person to person. An organ builder and repairman in one village heard it and took it to his Christmas Eve mass the following year, and so on and so on. And during the 19th century, Austria and Germany had scores of traveling folk singers, and so they learned the song and began to take it out to farther and farther places. In December of 1839, another Austrian family group, the Rainers, traveled to New York, and they performed a Silent Night for the first time in America. America, and now Silent Night is the most recorded song in the world, all because an organ wouldn't work hours before a Christmas Eve service. So if he can do it, we can do it. Over the past few weeks here at Epworth, we've been learning the stories behind some of the most beloved Christmas carols, hoping that they would make our Advent, our preparation for Christmas more meaningful. So it's fitting, I think, that tonight we come to the story of Silent Night, the song that in many churches will be the closing song everybody hears before they leave. I've been thinking a lot about silence the past few weeks, what it means, how it intersects with the Christmas story, why this song, above all others, seems to connect for people in a truly emotional way. We use that word, silent, to describe that first Christmas morning, but I cannot imagine a less silent scene. I have not given birth, but I've seen it on TV, which is just like real life. And in real life, when I was in second grade, one of my sisters, number five out of eight in our family, was born at home in my parents' bedroom with the help of a midwife. And it was anything but silent. People bustled around, the nurse, the midwife, friends who were there to keep the small children out of the way and who didn't do a very good job at doing so. And my mom and dad were certainly not silent. The only silence I remember that day is when they shut themselves up in their room after she was born to decide on a name. It took forever. And we sat waiting on the couch with Aunt Jan and Miss Mary for them to break that silence. Her name became Jean Marie Sarah, just in case you were wondering. So you add all of that noise, the noise of birth to the surroundings, a manger filled with animals who wouldn't know that something holy and extraordinary was happening. They wouldn't know to be silent. So then why do we describe it that way? 
And why does this description seem to speak to us in such a profound way? I've always been a little uncomfortable with silence. Most of us are. But I think I'm particularly uncomfortable with it because the house that I grew up in was rarely silent with eight children, um, three sisters two years apart who all hit puberty at the same time and like to argue. It was rarely silent in our house. I learned to do schoolwork amid the chaos of my many siblings. So when I went to college, I found it really strange that people went to a silent library to do their work. I couldn't do that. I always needed, and I still need, noise in the background when I'm working. Really, many of us are uncomfortable with silence. When silence happens, we start to kind of scooch around and look around waiting to see what's going to break the silence. But I don't think we should be uncomfortable with it. If you think about it, there are really many kinds of silences. We are silent when we're full of joy and can't think of words to share, maybe when your child is first born or at some point during your wedding day. We are silent when we're angry and just can't think of words, or sometimes when we're hurt and we don't know how to say it or express it. I think silence can be both an emptiness, a depletion of sound, but it can also be filled. Silence can be filled with something. I think this word silence in this song, silent night, holy night, speaks to us so profoundly because we as human beings long for that holy silence in the midst of a world full of chaotic noise. We hear noises all day, at home, at work, on the TV, the radio, our phones. We are constantly bombarded by sounds. And some of them are good, right? The sounds of our children's laughter, the sound of music, of our loved ones speaking to us. But still, our bodies long for the holy silence that this song speaks of. We long for it because it is a part of us. Silence is needed. It is in our very bones. Silence is used in both language and music as a kind of accent. In music, it helps us define the rhythm in some ways. And in language, I think it's used the same way. Thomas Merton said it this way, for language to have meaning, there must be intervals of silence somewhere to divide word from word and utterance from utterance. He who retires into silence does not necessarily hate language. Perhaps it is love and respect for language which imposes silence upon him. For the mercy of God is not heard in words unless it is heard both before and after the words are spoken in the silence. Here's one more way to think about the miracle of what happened on that first Christmas day. Jesus, the word, as the Gospel of John tells us and we proclaimed in our call to worship today, came in silence for us. The living word comes on that silent and holy night into a world full of chaos and noise. Maybe as Merton suggests, God came in silence to divide words from the word, to give meaning to what was happening for us. We talk a lot in the church about the importance of Emmanuel, that word, Jesus, God with us, God walking around in human skin, being willing to be a part of our brokenness in a new way so that we could be saved from our own brokenness. And that is certainly a very important part of the Christmas story. But I also think the notion that the word coming into the world created one silent and holy night is significant. And the fact that we come and return to that silent night each year is meaningful. Scripture never calls it silence. You won't hear that word in the Gospel of Luke or in the Gospel of Matthew, which is a very small snippet of Jesus' birth story. But this is how we feel when we hear the story. Like all of the pieces have suddenly come together and we can be at peace. And I imagine that that's how Mary and Joseph felt that first night with their son, even as the animals made noises around them and the shepherds came praising God. I imagine it felt like all the pieces had suddenly fallen into place and they were so filled with joy that there was nothing to say. As I said earlier, we need silence. We need it to hear and understand the word of God. We need to be silent so that we can hear when God speaks to us. We need those places of silence to calm and center and focus ourselves in God's love. But then, once the silence is over, we must enter back into the world. 
we cannot be silent forever. We must, like Mary, ponder these things in our heart. We must, like the shepherds, glorify God with our feet and our voices. We must share the good news that today for us the Christ child has been born. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for that silent and holy night. We thank you for the words of the Christmas carols that tell us once again the story of your birth. We thank you for the way that music speaks to us like nothing else does. We thank you for the reminder that we need to cultivate places of silence in our own lives where we can be connected with your holy word, your living son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. As we respond to God's word that we've heard read and proclaimed, I invite you to stand as we affirm our faith together. The words will be on the screen. And it's also number 885 in your hymnal. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Please be seated. Oh, I'm just kidding. Stand back up. <laughs> Ten years, I still don't have it. Let's join together in singing Joy to the World, number 246. Let me check. Now please be seated. <laughs> we'll continue our service of word and table by following along with the invitation and great thanksgiving. You can follow along in your hymnal on page six or also on the screen. The grace, 
Christ invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the silence, let us confess our own personal prayers of confession. My friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the words that Christ taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, the bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. 
The cup over which we give thanks is the sharing in the blood of Christ. In the United Methodist Church, we celebrate an open table, which means that anybody who is wanting a deeper relationship with God, no matter where your membership stands, you're welcome to come and dine at this table because it doesn't belong to us, it belongs to God. We will serve this morning by intinction. We'll have uh, this morning, this evening, what time is it? We will serve today by intinction. We'll have two servers on either side and the ushers will directly direct you forward. We will tear off a piece of the bread and you can dip it into the cup. We do have gluten-free uh, wafers available, so if you need that, please just let us know once you come up to the front. Friends, the feast has been prepared for you so that you might taste and see that the Lord is good. So come as you are able.
Thanksgiving after communion. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Friends, I invite you to go in peace, to know that Christ has been born in us this day. Go forth to praise God with your voices and with your feet. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill towards all. In the name of the one who created, redeems, and sustains us. Amen. Now with joyful voices, let us sing together in singing the first verse of Joy to the World. <laughs> 